So this is the Crab Nebula. This is where we left off uh, last time. This is the last podcast for the unit. And we're going to talk about neutron stars and black holes. A really exciting uh, topic to talk about. But first off, so last time we talked about massive stars, go through this uh, rapid uh, fusing of hydrogen into helium and so on, all the way to iron and the core collapses, and then that causes a shock wave which can blow up the entire star in a supernova. Well, this is a picture of what's left over called the Crab Nebula. And this is uh, the remnants of the supernova that the Chinese actually recorded when they saw a new star in the sky. Now that new star eventually faded and uh, with current technology, we, we look back and start searching for that star that they, they saw that uh, eventually faded. And this is what we see. And sometimes stars completely blow themselves up. And it's really important when they do because when stars explode, they take all those heavy elements that they forged within the core and in that supernova explosion and they seed other nebula. Uh, without that, uh, there would be no uh, chance to have new planets like the Earth and uh, things heavier than hydrogen and helium because all that would be locked up in stars. All right. But since stars do explode and send their guts out into space, they can mix in with other stars and form other planets, or uh, nebula, form other planets and things like that. But it's also possible that they do leave something behind, neutron stars and black holes. All right, let's first talk about the possibility of a neutron star. Now, what is a neutron star? Well, a neutron star is basically the leftovers of that really dense ball of neutrons that formed at the end of uh, uh, that heavy star's uh, life. All right, when the iron core collapsed and broke down into all of the uh, protons and neutrons and the protons turned into neutrons, well, that can, can be left over. And the reason why it's rapidly spinning is Think of a, a, a skater collapsing their arms. The tighter they bring their arms, the faster it spins. And this ball of, of neutrons, all right, this core was about the size of the Earth or so and collapsed down to about 10 miles. All right. But it's not a true star all right, because it's not producing light due to nuclear fusion inside of its core anymore. Um, but it is only about 10 miles or so in size, so it's exceptionally small. Uh, it's uh, originally had a star's mass of about 8 to 25 solar masses. Uh, a lot of that did uh, go uh, out into space with the uh, supernova, but if you have a neutron or a ball of neutrons, that's about 2 to 3 solar masses still. All right, that's the mass uh, that's left over in the neutron star. Now you have 2 to 3 of our suns. All right, masses wise, collapse down into neutrons and only about 10 miles wide. This is extremely dense. In fact, if you could somehow grab a, a thimbleful of this material and bring it back to the earth, put it on a scale, all right, that one thimbleful would weigh millions of tons. All right, it's so densely packed. Um, so it's, that's pretty incredible to think about. All right, but. The reason why it doesn't get any smaller than that is because it did reach hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, it's just with this weird new force called neutron degeneracy pressure. All right. It's kind of complicated, all right, but it gets into the fact that, uh, that neutrons cannot basically share the same space or the same uh, quantum, um, the same quantum state. Basically, they can't get any closer together. All right, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, so it did re reach equilibrium. As long as it's between two to three solar masses and about 10 miles wide, all right, that's the general idea for a neutron star. And if we take a look at this, come back to our Crab Nebula. Well, this is invisible light. It looks really, really cool. And when scientists uh, started studying this, they didn't really expect to find anything else. But when they uh, looked at it in other forms of light, they were finding that this isn't uh, uh, a, a dead space. All right? It's active. There's something in the middle here. And what they actually found when they looked at it in X-ray right, and uh, UV is they found that there was a very intense bright spot in the middle of it. 
All right. And you can kind of see that it looks like there are these jets and this swirling motion around it. And in fact, uh, we can actually see and hear. Here, the neutron star that is being uh, that is spinning rapidly in the center here. So the last topic for the unit, let's talk about black holes. Black holes are these really weird things, uh, and there's a lot of unknowns yet, but we think that they start off with a really massive star beyond 25 solar masses. It collapses down, all right, iron core, iron core turns into neutrons, and if those neutrons, uh, that core left over is more than three solar masses, the pull of gravity is just still too strong, that not even that neutron degeneracy pressure can overcome it. And that collapses all of that mass down into a point. Well, how can how can things take uh, take up only a point in space? That's a really good question. And I don't know. All right, but this point in space all right, is called the singularity. This is actually the black hole. All right, it's uh, where all the mass has has been collected and is squeezed together. So we're going to break it down into just some basic questions now that students normally have. And I will answer them the best I can. And if you have a question that is not on here, please come up and ask me uh, in class. I'd love to, uh, love to talk about it. So first off, if they're black holes, how can we see them? Great question. Um, well, here's a picture. And here's another picture. So obviously, these black holes don't look very black. And in reality, all right, we're not seeing a black hole. We're seeing things surrounding the black hole, all right? Because black holes are black because they don't emit any light. All right, and we'll get to why in a bit. All right, but we can see stuff falling into it. And again, if we go back to Kepler's third law lab, you guys actually already did this. You saw things orbiting around black holes. And uh, the reason why we can know how much they weigh is because of Kepler's laws, all right? Uh, in fact, you weighed, for lack of a better term, or mass would be better, you massed a black hole at, uh, at in the center of our galaxy at 4 million solar masses. Right. So why are they black then? All right, this is a little more complicated. So let's do some uh, simulations here to try and cover this. So the uh, basic rule here, or explanation, is that gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape it. And here's why. So before we can explain why, all right, I'm gonna show this little simulation here. All right, so let's go all the way back to Newton and gravity. Um, we already talked about him a little bit, but we also need to talk about something called escape velocity. So let's imagine you have a cannon on top of this mountain and you fire it off. It's gonna go off a certain distance and hit the ground. And if I bump up the speed that I shoot it, it's gonna go a little bit farther before it hits the ground and a little bit faster. It's gonna go a little bit farther, but you can reach a speed in which you can reach uh, what's called an orbit, all right? That it doesn't quite hit the ground, but actually comes all the way back and smacks you in the back of the head, all right? This is basically how um, uh, satellites work. Well, there's also a speed in which you have to shoot, say, a satellite or uh, anything else to escape the uh, pull of gravity from the Earth. All right? That is known as the escape velocity. If you reach this escape velocity, uh, that object will never come back. It will actually escape the Earth's pull. All right. Well, there's the same thing for a black hole. All right. Depending on the mass of the object, all right, if we get too close to uh, a black hole, what happens is our escape velocity starts to increase. And you can actually get uh, to a point at which if you go past a certain point in space, right, and this point in space is known as the event horizon, it's just an imaginary line, all right, this is the point as if you get closer and closer to a star, your escape velocity eventually reaches where you have to go faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. And it is physically impossible, as far as we know, 
to go beyond the speed of light. So if you pass this, you're not in the singularity necessarily, which means you're not completely crushed to a, a point in space. But if you're in a little spaceship and get too close to this event, uh, past this event horizon, your engines cannot push you fast enough to actually go beyond the speed of light, and therefore you can never escape. That's why uh, they're black. Light can't travel fast enough to actually go out. All right, what happens if you did travel near a black hole? Well, all right, most likely what happens is just like if a moon, uh, save for Saturn's rings, got too close and passed a certain limit, the forces of gravity nearer, all right, actually pull harder than the ones before it or on the other side of the moon. Well, if you were falling uh, feet first towards uh, a black hole, your feet would be pulled harder than your head. And what would happen before you actually got into the black hole, all right, this black hole would actually cause your feet to get pulled harder than your head and you'd just rip you apart. All right, kind of a, a, a gruesome way to die. But what if, what if you could somehow withstand these forces? What happens if you actually could get into the black hole? You know, students want to start talking about parallel universes and wormholes and things like that. And, you know, the, the real answer here is that nobody knows. Uh, the problem with black holes in the singularity is that you would have to uh, use both quantum mechanics to talk about the exceptionally small. And you'd also have to use laws of physics governing the really big massive things uh, relativity and at this point they just don't they don't talk to each other all right uh the laws of physics can't explain what happens so no one really knows what happens beyond the, uh, the black hole's singularity so where can we find black holes then well just like any star there are some floating around in space uh, but they're really hard to find because again they don't emit any light but what we found, all right, and like you've calculated, we know there's a black hole, a supermassive black hole, in fact, because it's 400 million times the mass of our sun in the center of our Milky Way galaxy. All right, and when we start looking at other galaxies, what we find was actually that we think that there is a supermassive black hole found in the center of every galaxy. In fact, they might be critical in the formation of a galaxy. We're not 100% sure, but because uh, we haven't seen all of the galaxies and been able to explore them. But our, our current guess, or excuse me, our current hypothesis is that uh, that all galaxies have a supermassive black hole in the center. Some may be billions of solar masses, which is pretty uh, incredible to think about. Mm -hmm.